and welcome everyone to our new time. Well, just for this weekend, um, Saturday uh, live stream. And so I hope that you guys uh, found out about it last week and uh, we'll see how many we can bring in today. Uh, like I said, tomorrow is Easter and we'll, we have so many things going on that I couldn't possibly fit in a live stream, at least not according to my family. So I had to abide by them and uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, have a lot of fun tomorrow. So anyway, um, I want to show you what I'm drinking. Okay, this is so it looks like maybe tea or whatever. Actually, it's a little bit of a carbonated beverage made out of tamarindo. So tamarindo or tamarind, as it is known in other English-speaking tropical regions of the world. This is found everywhere that's tropical. It looks awful. Let me show you what this looks like because there is no way that anyone in their right mind would want to eat, let alone drink anything made out of this, okay? So it grows on a tree. I remember my father in Puerto Rico, we had tamarindo, and he would go get it. They're like giant, um, sort of like uh, pods. And so inside is a seed coated with this sweet and tart um, coating, fruity coating. And you have to take apart these crispy little, um, they look like beans, and remove the seeds with the meat attached to them soak them in water for hours and add sugar and eventually all of that fruity coating dissolves wow a lot of work um so in puerto rico we make something that is typical of the island it's actually they claim it was invented there but i don't know basically it's just a snow cone but they use a block of ice and something that looks like a wood planer like a hand plane tool it has a blade, and in the rear of the unit, there's a compartment for the shaved ice. And if you go to any tropical Caribbean, especially Caribbean country nowadays, you may run into that. And so the little handheld cart that goes with wheels down the street selling these piraguas, they call it, and um, that is after named after a native name for a canoe from a certain... Um, areas in the in the amazon region in south america so don't ask me why but anyway piragua means a shaved ice cone and you then dribble all kinds of homemade syrups on it whatever flavor you want and it is it's, it's a delicacy that we've been enjoying since i was a little kid and uh, my friend just actually just went there and she did have one so i'm happy to hear that they are still being sold in all the touristy areas. They used to be found, you know, in our, our local town in the corner. There was a vendor uh, selling piragua, five cents for a piragua. Now I'm, I assume it's a buck fifty or two dollars, of course, <laughs> like everything else. But this is really delicious. It's an acquired taste. It actually has a lot of nutrients in it that are very important for you and vitamins. So I, I buy myself a bottle of this every once in a while, and it'll take me like four days to drink it. But anyway, it is something that I, I just cannot forget. It is It brings back the memes. So, all right, let's say hello to everyone that who's, who is here. And as always, join us. Jump in the chat. Tell us who you are. We have 24 at this point right now. Hopefully, we'll have a few more. Um, just so you guys know, the weekend of the 27th, 28th, that would have been the 28th of April would have been a live stream. I'm going to be out of town. I'm going to be visiting my sister by myself. My wife is going to stay home. Um, she's doing some sort of um, choral presentation with her, her group. And so it's going to be about Disney music. So she begged me to go. So I am going um, and then I will be back. So maybe we'll do something, say... Uh, the day after when I come back on maybe a Monday night, would that be, if that is just too horrible to, to comprehend Monday night live stream, uh, maybe I can do it during the noon day. Um, the reason is because normally I pick up my grandson from school, uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and he gets out at three. So I would have to finish it, you know, quickly around two o'clock 
and then immediately get ready to go because I got to drive up and then I got to find parking and you know how it is. Anyway, so the 27th, 28th, that weekend, no live stream unless I can come up with something again. That's what happens every summer with me. So anyway, all right. So let's say howdy to everybody. Nigel Waters. Let's see how early this man came in today. 1138. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. Usually he's here like early morning. Uh, but anyway, welcome back, my friend. As always, as always, a true supporter of this live stream, always here with us. Um, he's from Wales, UK. He's got a Canon Pro 300. He's the guy that's been doing this successfully. And I believe one of those guys that has a 300 had an episode with the uh, waste ink pads requiring a replacement. And lucky that in, in Europe, in England, in Wales or wherever, uh, not here so much, uh, they can go ahead and replace them. And I think they needed to do other uh, components uh, uh, replacement as well. So it turned out to be a little bit pricey, but at least now he's got a brand new machine, literally, that will last him a long, long time. Martin Van Gogh is here from the Netherlands. Epson Short Color P900. And the roll unit, which is nice, nice to have, that really opens up that printer to to uh, type of workflow that you could never achieve otherwise as far as uh, creating uh, perfectly straight, no skewing uh, panoramic uh, prints, especially if you have a roll unit. And if you have, um, I think the, the P900, very similar probably to the 800, where you can actually choose it to print what they call banner mode. And by by that, I mean that it just prints one print after the other without you having to create a, a custom paper size or whatever. You do that in your driver, say 13 by 19s or 17 by 25, and you just print, 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 and then later you trim them yourself. Uh, I think the P900 may have some, I think you have to, trim by hand correct me if i'm wrong but yeah still it opens up that printer to you know features that no one else has as far as the lesser uh level printers photo nikon 780 is here from edmonton canada canon pro 1000 epson et 8550 xp 15000 qmh ultimate lifetime canon epson red river papers and oem inks so you're using oem by the way and I should have brought it in, but you just take my word for it. I remember I made some AI creations of, I did a space scene with ships and planets and stars and nebulas everywhere, full of color, gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, it would make a fantastic poster. I made a print on, I think it was like luster paper on the 8550. And I put it on my rear window of my car. So it's sitting back there with the umbrella and getting hit by sunlight and all kinds of light. Oh, obviously, the, the windshield, the, the not windshield, the rear window blocks some of the UV. I mean, but a lot of light passes through regardless. It is exposed to outside air. And it's been, gosh, what, two, three months of straight onslaught by light and other elements and no fading so that's that's what you get with this printer if anyone was wondering so obviously you're not going to ever expose your beautiful prints to that sort of environment but so far so good and i'm just going to let it sit there through the summer and see what happens uh we'll maybe let it sit for a whole year and we'll see then i'll go ahead and print another one and we'll make a direct comparison that's one way to check without having to deal with instruments and, you know, spectrophotometers and special color patches like they normally do. OK, so we'll just visually look at the difference between a freshly printed one and the one that sat out there for a whole year. We'll see what we get. If it passes. Wow. Then all our worries down the toilet, because then you can rely on that printer with OEM inks to create something that's long lasting. Imagine how many fold more lifespan you would get under normal conditions. I, you can't see this, but I got prints on my wall. Under those conditions, there's no issues. 
because you're not outside getting bombarded by light constantly during the day in other elements and inside you're protected you're you have subdued lighting it's 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 incandescent bulbs they don't have uv uh, really much of that and so unless your house is full of ozone that would be the only the only uh, reason anything would fade in an indoor environment richard mauro ricuti from Fort Collins, Colorado, and he's got a Canon Pro 1000. Mm. Top camera, top printer, not camera. George, George Gab is here from West Texas, and he's 69. Right here today, I saw a lot of people. We went shopping just before I had to, you know, come downstairs and do this because I needed to buy something for tomorrow's dinner. Um, but I saw a lot of people running around in shorts, and our, our, Farmer's market was active today, and all the people are acting like it's summertime. So, but let me see. It is 61 here, so 61 and cloudy. We're supposed to get a bit of rain tomorrow. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I think Monday, Wednesday, Monday through Wednesday. Unfortunately, that's when we're going to Gettysburg with our grandson and my son. Hope it doesn't rain too much on us. To tell you the truth, all they care about is hanging around the hotel and going across the street to the ice cream place. Yeah. Harold Davies is here from La Crosse, Wisconsin. We, at the end of this, we're going to do some printing as we always do. And I have that new one you just sent me, the uh, re-edited black and white, I believe it was, from France. So we'll go ahead and print that along with others. And I want to also show you guys what I used to do when I, when I did weddings, when I actually shot weddings. So... I did special types of layouts for album pages, and I had a company that did a fantastic job with these borderless prints, not prints, but pages that you can actually open. Actually, no, there were actual prints, and you, you can open, get a two-page without a seam that you could tell. Amazing. I don't know where they have gone. It used to be about $400 to have an album made, so of course... I passed that on to my customers, but they did a fantastic job. I just want to show you what type of layouts I used to do, and I'll show you my daughter's wedding and other, other uh, weddings that I did. Should be fun. By the way, uh, he's got a Pro 1000 2100 PCSE, QMH shooting and editing like any, everyone else. All right. Richard Tusowski says, hello from Ontario, Canada. Canon Pro 1000, Epson R3000, times three. You got three of those? I have one. And it is it is stuck on matte uh, due to a bad uh, blocking switch valve. Tim Miller from Louisiana, Pro 100 PCSE inks, uh, Rick and Rudy's items, Red River Paper and QMH1. We're up to 28 right now. So I think people just didn't remember that we were going to be on Saturday. So that's fine. That's not a problem. So George Gab has um, PTO10 Ink Owl, um, EcoTank 8550 OEM, and Topaz Sharpen AI. Daniel Torres from Boca Raton, Florida, has a Pro 100 and a Epson P800. Welcome. Welcome, Daniel. And Nigel Waters is here, and he just got back from work. I'm a bit late. No, you're good. You're good. Because um, we just started out. You didn't miss out much on much. I don't know how to pronounce that, but W.S. Shep, Shep, W. Shep, uh, from Redondo Beach, California. Uh, that, that's where the days when I lived in uh, Southern Cal. Um, Epson 7800, Ecotank 80. Ecotank, no, E.T., no. That cannot be. So you mean a um, X, what is it? XP 15,000. 15, so I don't think there is an EcoTank 15,000. And he does sublimation with that. My daughter's trying to get into that. And she didn't call me back as, you know, I was going to offer her all this stuff. Boy, I tell you, life must be making her busy. Harold Davies says, I would miss the voice 
on Monday. There is an excellent Puerto Rican singer in the running. Oh, really? Yeah, you wouldn't want to do that. Of course, you can record it. And also, you can record. This is recorded. You can watch me later. But I don't know what we're going to be doing that week. I'll, I'll let you guys know. I'll keep you guys uh, informed. Daniel Torres says, question for Jose and the group. I am looking to buy a SIS for my Pro 100. How is your experience after a year of use? Well, that's during that time, I realized that uh, even though they sort of hinted that the chips would auto reset, of course, there's no such thing as an auto reset chip for the Pro 100. Maybe for overseas uh, Pro 100s with their firmware, but ne definitely not for the US based uh, Pro 100. So, what happens when the chip goes empty? Obviously, since you're running external tanks, they're full. The cartridges, if you want to call them that, they're called dampers that replace the actual cartridges. They have hoses attached to them. Those are full. So regardless of whether the chip is empty or not, those are full. So you just perform a chip disabling at that point. Once the chip goes empty, press the pause button, five seconds. That chip will now stay empty and you know, you, you just rely visually on the external um, tanks that you have on the side of the printer. Uh, Ink Products sells that system. It, it is installed relatively easy. It's got a fantastic um, segmented belt type arrangement for your ribbon, uh, your line, ink line ribbon. So there is no jamming or anything like that. Uh, there are videos on their sites that... Um, their site that shows you exactly how to install it. It worked. Unfortunately, my print had died during the time. So it was time. It, it was over a year and a half old. So uh, I, I'm not going to reinstall that system. I'm going to go back to my regular uh, refillable system. Um, the cartridges that I have basically uh, modified for refilling, since I have a resetter, I might as well just do that. The owner of the company just told me, well, you can just reset the chips. Sure, you can do that, but then I would have to remove every time. No, you don't want to do that with assist units because all of the cartridges are linked to ink lines. It's a royal mess, so you don't want to do that. Once you install them, every time one of them reaches empty, you get a non-recognition warning. You just disable that chip. It'll continue printing because you're constantly feeding ink through those ink lines. So, yeah, it does work. Anything else from another company, China, eBay, you know, Alibaba or AliExpress? No, no. They don't have that segmented belt. That is the key. And I have a couple of videos on that uh, while I was installing it. Go ahead and watch it. And uh, I have a playlist just for that particular uh, product. You can go ahead and watch that and see for yourself. Now, I was using their inks, not Precision Colors inks. I was getting very, fairly good results. Um, nothing that I couldn't resolve maybe by custom profiling if you're really super picky. But for most of your work, it did provide sufficient quality output. Peter B. Hi, all from the Netherlands. Have you been here before, Peter? I don't remember, but welcome, welcome. Rizard Tosowski, my R3000s are stuck in MAT2. Yeah, it always happens. It's always the the position for um, the glossy black or the photo black that fails. So imagine um, two small streams merging into one big stream and you have a gate and both of them cannot flow at the same time. So either you open up the gate and allow stream A, that would be photo black or matte black. What happens is that on the when you open up to allow the photo black, and you try to then switch back, it fails. It, it does not close it. So once you mess with it for hours, you finally get it to close, and that's it. Just stay stay with the matte black gate open, in other words. And that way you can continue to use those printers. They're a pain. Ecotank 15,000. Is that a US-based Ecotank or foreign? Wow, I didn't know that existed. I'm going to have to tell. So what is, the, is that a, um, like a letter size version? Does it use the same number of inks? 
I'm surprised. I haven't kept up with any of this. So that's a oh, four color. Okay, up to 11 by 17. Okay, all right, I got you. Very good. So that's that's like in between the, okay, the 5,000, no, the 8,500 is the same number of colors, so six cartridges or six tanks and letter size. So this is now in between. Okay, that is, I didn't know that. So thank you. Thanks for the info. Awesome. All righty. So if I choose to use, I got to read my comment, my, my topics here. Other inks besides OEM. Can I just print using paper manufacturers, ICC profiles, or must I use a custom ICC profile? Like, like I just touched on just, just a few minutes ago, only if you're super picky. So let me, let's just say, Disregard all of those cheap, where you buy by the liter on eBay from China. Those are literally almost, I would call them universal inks. They're supposed to work with every printer. In other words, don't 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 even attempt to use those. I'm talking about U.S. produced inks. So you guys know every every ink seller in the United States, unless they have a contract someplace else outside of the United States for ink production, and they're able to, say, conduct testing and output quality and accuracy testing like someone I know does, then they would contract those, those laboratories to create custom inks for them. But all of the ink resellers here are selling inks that are made in the U.S., and they're simply what I call the off-the-shelf. I don't want to call it a generic. That has a That's a bad tone to it. But if you get what I'm talking about, generic just means that it's, it's an inkjet set for the Pro 10 or the Pro 100 or whatever. So these labs will create these ink sets. They are then sold in bulk to the distributors, Ink Owl, Ink Products, whoever. And they rebottle it in their premises and seal it. They seal the bottles and, and sell it to you. And that way, with their label attached, so you think you're getting something that is a specific brand, but really it's not. It's just the same ink set. It's like milk from the same farm, the same number of cows, but they sell to different bottling companies and they sell each batch as their brand. So that's what the ink companies are doing here. Um, I don't know, I cannot tell you for the life of me, except for one guy, Precision Colors, of any other company who may have been doing some pre-testing prior to say purchasing in bulk a particular ink set for them to then sell to you. And that, that for, for example, for the Pro 1000. So when, when the Pro 1000 came out and we all realized, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Because, you know, we are all about refilling. So what are we going to do when inks come out for this and we want to test them? There's no way in God's green earth I can effectively test inks for the Pro 1000. Like, you know, from five different sellers. How am I going to do that? There's like 25, 30 ml of ink in each pathway between the tank, the internal compartment, the ink lines, the internal dampers in the printhead, and the printhead itself. So, in other words, imagine I'm testing different types of fuel. But my tank is over there, and my engine is over here. And in between that 50 yards of lines is the previous fuel. So there's no way I can test my new fuel until my new fuel arrives at the destination, which is the engine. The same thing with these printers. So there's no way that you can you know, immediately overnight test that. You would have to waste so much ink by performing these huge ink recharges 
change your wasting cartridge three times that evening, and then you can test to see. You would have to have made some test prints prior and some test prints post. And no, that's unacceptable. You can't do that. So the idea is like the person who asked that question, do I need ICC profiles for that ink? Well, yes, of course you do. Of course you do. So the idea with the Pro 1000 specifically was that Mr. Lee wanted to have you, the user, you, the one who purchases inks, to have. He then invented this phrase, a seamless transition. What is that? Well, that means nothing happens. You output before standard image print. You install the new cartridges or whatever, your empties refill with the new ink. You have new chips installed. They have those available. And then you start printing and you will not see any changes because you still have, like I said, like 30, 35 ml of ink from the previous OEM load. Now you're dealing with a third party load. So I don't know how in the world he did it. I think he utilized the Pro 10 for certain experiments. Hang on. And come to find out that the replacement inks for, for instance, you know, the third party replacements for several of the colors did not come up to par, at least not his uh, description of par. So they did not perform like he expected them to perform. He says, oh, well, I'll just have to have my customers buy OEM inks. Where am I going to get OEM inks in bulk? Well, I got contacted by someone else by chance. This is all by chance. A former distributor for Canon who still has access to products. And he was selling 700 ml cartridges. So from that, we can get quite a few, maybe eight 82 ml loads because it takes 82 ml to load one of these cartridges from empty. So that's how he was getting the, the uh, OEM mix. And the colors were red, yellow, and magenta. Red, yellow, and, and blue. Sorry. Red, yellow, and blue. And, of course, chrome optimizer as well. So I don't know what the situation is with this guy, whether he can still provide precision colors, those, those colors. But now, all of a sudden, he has found out a source of yellow ink that is compatible that pretty much matches OEM. So that's no longer an issue. You can use the third-party version. And I think red or blue, one of those. And of course, he's not using the uh, OEM Chrome Optimizer anymore. We He found another one that comes close to the original level of gloss. That's always been the issue where the third-party Chrome Optimizers just didn't have the gloss that you would expect from OEM. So that's it. Now it costs you less to buy the kit. Now, do you need a custom ICC profile? Technically, technically speaking, no, you do not. Because the output, now I'm running those inks and it's been a long, long time. So I'm absolutely sure that I am running his inks through my printer at this point. There's no trace of OEM ink except for the yellow, red, and blue and the chrome optimizer that I am still using. Um, but in the near future, I'm going to stop using those because they have been replaced with third-party um, equivalents. So do I need ICC profiles? Long story here, right? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because I'll tell you this, and if you didn't know this, then you now know it. When they make ICC profiles for a Pro 1000, and this depends on you, the user, they're going to make those profiles on their papers, of course, not other people's papers, but their papers on a calibrated Pro 1000 printer. And what is that? What the heck is that? Well, there is a functionality in your screen, and it allows you to take any errors, any deviations in output 
because there's going to be. This is a product made in an assembly line. The programming of that motherboard, the firmware, and all of that, it it is never going to be exactly, it's never going to be able to produce exactly the same output. There's going to be a deviation. How much, plus or minus, you know, uh, you just really don't know. So like my uncalibrated Pro 1000 will not match your uncalibrated Pro 1000. Maybe it will, maybe it doesn't. So there is a discrepancy. But they are recalibrating their printer internally. That's a function that you should do the minute you set it up. Okay, do the internal calibration. What does that do? It brings it to factory so-called, let's just say what they hope it is, um, output quality, theoretical output quality. And if I run the calibration as well, then my printer is outputting at the so-called level of theoretical output quality. Wait, just like yours, right? So let's just say you're Canon. You're the, the, the private contractor they hired to make profiles for their Pro 1000, their ink, and their papers. Your printer had better be calibrated. Now, I take those profiles, download them, install them on my hard drive, and I print them, print with them. But stupid Jose did not calibrate his Pro 1000. I'm not going to get the level of quality they intended for me to be able to achieve. I would have to calibrate my printer, bring it to the same level as theirs. Okay? Otherwise, I'm going to be like this or like this. It depends. So calibration of your Pro 1000. That's that's one of the things that Pro 1000 allows you to do. And it pretty much guarantees that it will output what the factory intended it to be. Mm. No other printer allows you to do that that I know of, except the rest of the family of the uh, IPF printers from Canon. So... That is something you need to do. So that means then I can use their profile. I don't need to use a custom profile. If I calibrate my printer internally and I'm using OEM inks, if I switch over to PC, once I know that it's running PC, I run a new standard image print, compare it to the previous one. And if I get them mixed up, I won't be able to tell which one was printed with what inks, you see. Now, regardless of how good the output is, how how accurate it matches the OEM output, PC has decided, well, I'm going to make profiles for everyone anyway. So, of course, their printer is calibrated, and they're running profiles on everything else besides Canon papers. And you can download those profiles, download those profiles, for free so what else can you ask for you know you don't have to worry about buying a spectral photometer for 1500 bucks you just download those profiles wait his printer was pre pre-calibrated make sure yours is as well and whatever paper you're using if he happens to have a profile for it you download that install it and then print with it and that means you'll get the the best quality possible from that combination, Pro 1000 pet calibrated, Pro, Pro, calibrated Pro 1000, ICC profile, custom made for a paper that is maybe not Canon and non-Canon inks. That's, that's why you need to use an ICC profile. But technically speaking, if you're using Canon papers, it's such a good match anyway. Such a good match. But they still made profiles for the Canon papers. PC did that. So he must think there's still a bit of a difference. So I haven't been able to see that with my eyes. Okay. Long story for a very simple and a very simple question. But make sure that, yeah, if you have the ability to make a profile, remember you're working with your individual printer that Technically, theoretically, cannot be the same as somebody else's printer. 
So make their profiles. If you're gonna, if you have the ability to make them, make them for your printer in your environment. That way, you know absolutely you're gonna get the best possible squeeze, the last drop of quality out of that printer, that ink set, that paper. That's it. That's all you need to do. All right. So let's let's go here to the list over here. Oh, here's my. And we have Daniel Torres says, gracias, Jose. Your videos have been very helpful. That's the goal. That is the goal. I'm not doing this to become famous or anything like that. I did this also for my micro machining um, life that I have for 30 years prior to this channel becoming a photo channel. I used to do micro machining techniques using micro lathes and micro milling machines and drill presses, all kinds of very highly, highly um, high tech stuff, basically. Yeah. And um, we're talking in, in fractions of a thousandth of an inch machining. And I did that. I made micro steam engines that worked. Okay. So I did that also, I, I used to produce DVDs that I was selling back when DVDs were, were hot. Uh, not anymore. Uh, so that's kind of down the, down the toilet at this point. So I'm just concentrating on the photographic side of things. But that's how I got hooked on, on YouTube and, and uh, video creation and that sort of thing. So George Gap says, going to set up a Synology B station later okay i have no no idea what that is please tell me kevin briniarski says is kevin from ellsworth wisconsin how are you doing good so i told my my sister-in-law that you were here and you were from ellsworth and she says where's that <laughs> i said well that's because you're from the east coast of wisconsin and you have no clue What's out there west, right? You told me that you were more toward the west border uh, near Minnesota. Kevin says, my Epson SCT20 170 maintenance box filled up after using the printer for five times. There's something wrong with it. Epson SC21. Can you just retype that in uh, numbers? <laughs> I, I I don't know which one you're referring to. So some of these, if this is like a, a higher end, uh, like a Epson printer with um, like cartridges that don't move, you know, stationary cartridges. Um, yeah, I have to know whether that cartridge, that that wasting cartridge is resettable or not, or if there even even if there is a resetter for it. Um, but yeah, if you ran a ton of cleaning cycles that five times or else there's something wrong with it. Maybe during the initial installation, it did dump a lot of, um, waste ink. I can't, I can't even begin to tell you why only printed five times with it. Hmm. That's kind of mysterious living abundantly. I noticed someone printing 13 by 32 inch panels on the EcoTank 8550 using pre-cut roll paper can you do a custom string to to do it or you mean you, should i do a video on it? It, it it's really nothing special you just go ahead and uh, cut your your sheets make sure that the edges are at right angles to perfect right angles to the lateral edges of the paper and that you feed it uh, perfectly straight otherwise it will start to skew and uh, that's it other than that really there's no science to it it's not, it's not um, rocket science, but um, if you can buy um, pre-cut sheets, I know, I think uh, Q, um, no, Red River has large cut sheets, but I think they start more like, um, do they have some that long? They might. The only, the only issue that I see is the curliness of the paper because it came from a roll. And often you have to then counter curl it so that it's not as curly when you insert it into the feeder. You have to sort of babysit it, babysit it while you're feeding it initially. But again, it's not something you can just 
walk away and just let it roll. Uh, you have to kind of babysit it, like I said. Take good care. Make sure that it's actually perfectly straight. Because something that long, even a small amount of skew, will begin to show at the end. But yeah, there's no there's no problem. You have to just simply create that uh, paper size, custom paper size in your driver. Mally Hudson Hudson Photography. Difficult to get PC inks. It's absolutely impossible, actually, at, the, at this point, because unless you ship through a third-party provider, which he makes available, actually, in, in, in his site, you have to still deal with all of the taxes that are involved. And it ends up costing you a ton of money. Um, just go ahead and, and, and uh, look up uh, octoinc.co.uk. Octo, like an octopus, octoinc, one word dot co dot uk his name is martin deal with him his inks come actually from the u.s so it'll be pretty much close let's just say uh close enough to pc okay good enough and uh very reasonably priced as well and he's a really good guy george brown i have an epson 2710 but it is not giving a a red it is uh off red and i okay you're talking about color management and i i i cannot even tell you oh and you're sublimating oh boy yeah um really there's no way to really deal with that you're going to have you're going to get different outputs because it's a totally different realm sublimation there's no color management at all um, people have tried making ICC profiles, believe me, no. So nothing I can tell you. Um, temperature will, will change the color. The length of pressing will change the color. The pressure will change the color. Your, your, your transfer paper brand will cost a different output. You see what I mean? There's so many different variables. There is no ICC profile. You have an ICC profile? You say you, wait. And I have ICC profile. Can you help? For sublimation, ICC profile for what are you printing on? What are you transferring on? If you're transferring on like aluminum, uh, like photographic type aluminum, sublimation aluminum, maybe. You have to turn the driver to off, no color management. And from whatever you're printing from, you tell it to use the profile. Okay, but the driver has to be turned off. And again, settings. What settings do you use? Other than possibly matte media. Okay. So, yeah, it's a totally different world. And so many, many, many people have trouble with just printing photos on photo paper. They think there's too many variables. They haven't heard of sublimation yet. It's like three times the variables. Okay. So everything has to be perfect. Okay. I would have to see what you're talking about and, you know, your actual setup and what you're printing with, how you're printing, uh, what, where did you get this profile from, what are your inks, where did you get your inks, they're all different, okay? And, you know, the one thing that blows people's minds when they look at the black ink is brown. So, yeah, it, it, it's different. Marco... 52 r marker 52 question about using a profile for black and white printing rather than a b the advanced black and white is the same custom profile for an eco tank 8550 used for both yes sure absolutely if it's a good profile yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna show you show you that today don't go anywhere stay here with me okay well I'm sorry, but I cannot read your language. And where are you from? But welcome, welcome. Glad to have you here. Sure Color T2170 is a roll printer and sheet printer. Okay. So that's going back to that other question. George says, cloud based, no, home based cloud for photos, etc. Which which can access from the internet simple design. Oh, okay. Way beyond my, I, I don't deal with things like that, unfortunately. 
sorry and this no the cartridges move okay that's different so we were talking about uh kevin uh what was that and you had yeah i don't know i don't know what to tell you what size uh maintenance cartridge does it use you're just gonna have to replace it what can i tell you unless there's a, a resetter for it if there's a resetter for it and you open it up just, just like this this has a, a wasting cartridge and i remove it i look at the top layer of those pads and i don't see ink the ink is entering from underneath from the end from the side if i don't see it that is actually being flooded with ink i can reset it there's a resetter for it rick johnson sells those for the EcoTank 8550, the 8500, and XP15000, all of those can be reset. If yours can be reset, you can do the same thing. Reset it and pop it back in. And just keep track on whether it's going to overflow or not. I cannot read or, or understand what you are writing, my friend. Sorry. Does anyone know? All right. Okay, so Harold Davies is talking to Living Abundantly. I have a Red River 30, 13 by 38 Palo Duro soft. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. And that'll be nice and flat. No curls. Okay. The only thing is, it's, it's a burrito paper. So you got to be careful that possibly, possibly areas that have a lot of, um, density will sort of soak in too much ink and buckle a little bit you could end up with head strikes maybe not maybe not it depends appreciate that no problem okay you're printing mugs oh boy yeah and then you have your media your your mugs i have lots of those and you know you have a mug press i assume so it's always going to be off it's never going to match your image you just hope you can recognize what you're printing actually it's not it's not going to be a perfect photographic match ever ever okay and it depends if you go 30 seconds too much too much press time it will change it will increase the density it will do this it will do that okay well you know what i'm going to have to remove you because you're not really helping matters, right? I mean, I, I let me see here. Yeah, we'll just delete everything. And I hate to do this, but, you know, sometimes there's been uh, sometimes where I do get a, uh, what they refer to a, uh, somebody who trolls, in other words. All right, so that's it let's go back to our next okay hold on molly hudson says yeah uh, about three years ago i got my pc inks and chips with no problems uh you mean for pro 1000 that would be the only printer i would buy chips for because uh, the others are resettable such as the pro 10 pro 100 uh and such all right she said yes okay so let's jump over to the next topic i placed a print from the ecotank 8550 in my rear window of my car i told you about that so that's what i wanted to tell you guys so so far it's been three months and i don't i don't physically see any any like massive amount of fading so that's that's really good to know for those who had questions about fading now normally what they do any of the couple of companies that do this for a living um yeah i'm sorry i had to take him off because he refuses to do a translation so sorry i i don't have the time for this at this point i don't want to be rude but if you're going to do this, um, make sure that you translate it to, unfortunately, English is, you know, the universal language in our world now. So anyway, so I, 
sorry about that. I, I hate to do that, but, you know. Anyway, so let's continue. So in order to do a test for durability of ink or longevity fade, uh, longevity testing, they have a specific set of patches. They know what those values are. You print them and you read them prior to the exposure that's going to cause that fading to occur. And that's usually done with arc lights and they measure the amount by megalux. And so how many megalux exposure does it take to cause this one patch to fade a specific amount? And you measure those density changes with the unit, such as the one right over here, uh, maybe even a fancier one. So that that is the way they do it. They just then publish the results but again, is that really like real world? No, it's not. Hang on. Can you get a third party maintenance card for the Pro 1000? Not really. Not that I know, but they're only $15. And I reset mine. The resetter is expensive as hell. It's like 90 bucks for a stupid resetter. The cartridge will allow like two runs before it becomes dangerous and you need to really replace it or throw it out and replace it so i am running a new one right at this moment on my pro 1000. see this box right here i got several units there just waiting it's just something you have to consider when you get a pro 1000 but yeah you can reset them just like i did with that and the xp 15000 those are being reset and i'm running them again just to see how many lives i can get how many resets i can get out of them with the xp 15000 i figure about four resets before the sponges just become super wet in other words so but yeah 15 bucks i believe is the canon price for the uh, mc20s people are still talking about yellow jello remember what that was so when we started uh, refilling the pro 100 and we were using available inks for it um nobody was flushing them and so you know your magentas your cyans your grays and blacks no issues you can just add the replacement ink to that sponge once you remove the the factory refill ball and you drill out the, the seat so it can accept a plug you just simply refill that chamber with ink the new ink it would blend in with the oem and you'd have no issues and continue printing uh, yes you're going to see some changes in output uh, especially back in those days those inks were really not that top of the line quality we have today um, then the yellow cartridge. So we were taking the yellow cartridge and do the same thing. Okay. I did it three straight times. Refilled the original yellow cartridge without flushing it once, twice, and third time. Put it back in. I'm getting ready to fly to visit my mom with the family. And I thought, oh, I should make her some prints so she can put them on her room wall in the rest home that she was living at and so i began printing i went upstairs let me grab some coffee before we leave come downstairs and all i got these magenta cyanish looking prints and i went well everybody looks pink what the heck is going on here run a nozzle check which immediately is what you should do anytime you see a problem and i had no yellow very bit, a very tiny bit of yellow. <gasps> I'm panicking. So I call Mike and Mike says, hmm, that's odd. Someone else contacted me and told me the same thing. So now we know. So I had hours before I had to leave. So I was able to take out the printhead and then ran. I just ran Windex through the channel and it cleared it out enough. Then I ran water uh, through it and then I put a a um, cartridge that I had already flushed and I flushed it with with um, Windex 
with some extra ammonia and that that formulation just five percent more ammonia that's all it was like regular ammonia you buy and i ended up with a nice clean um sponge i filled that one with uh, it's already dry i filled it with um the new ink from precision colors at the time the yellow ink and ran a couple of clean cleaning cycles and my yellow channel came back to life Whew. i printed those pictures and i went on my way down to florida later on i find out that it was a reaction between the oem yellow which is a formulation had been changed to make it very durable because apparently yellow was one of the least dye inks um, the least durable dye ink for that family of printers all of your canon dye ink printers so they replaced it made it extremely durable and extremely difficult to flush and reactive to other yellow inks okay yeah so that became the yellow jello rick johnson comes in and starts selling pre-modified flushed cartridges because of that particular reason so do you need to flush them well technically if nothing clogs up you really don't have to especially with pcse 42 inks because they are better than the oem inks yeah they are better they they output almost as good as a p2 the the p200 which is why they created the p200 okay because they needed to increase the quality of output of the pro 100. everybody thought the pro 100 was out of this world well it could have been better and so pc saw that created an ink set and in the output was just tremendously better and so but that yellow jello issue now what conditions had to be met met to create that gelling action well the only way to test this is on a petri dish and you put down a few drops of yellow oem and a few drops of yellow third party and let them slowly mingle together and you're looking at that constantly to see if there's any gelling action nothing no gelling action so what actually happened he did that continuously until finally somehow the planets were aligned correctly and he saw at the area where the two inks touched a bit of a thickening and so with me the only i was like the second person in the world to discover this issue and i had to refill three times and what happens what happens when you refill let me see i think i have yeah here we go here is a flush cartridge nice and white yellow and here is a just empty cartridge yellow so if i refill this assuming this was a fresh empty cartridge i would refill it ink will enter that bottom see the difference between the two layers that's where it enter a lot freely more freely than the upper layer and so i begin to use that ink but at some point just that that perfect storm condition occurs oh. and the correct proportions that's the magic or if you want to call it magic i don't call it magic i, I call it a uh, uh, a curse <laughs> a nightmare scenario that correct proportion occurs boom and you begin to get that gelling now what we needed to do was search 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 and search for a yellow that would not react and he's found it so the yellow you get now with the pcse inks does not react do you have to flush your cartridges i still say you have to okay if you think it's going to be a super pain in the butt to flush those cartridges yourself and then you got to wait three days for them to dry buy a set from rick and then do yours whenever you want to later but buy a set fill them all up reset the chips prior to that of course install them that's it you're done there's no mixture of remember i told you that the 
the new inks from PC are better than the OEM ones, output-wise, the quality of output is actually better. That's why they came up with the P200, because they knew they needed to improve the output of the inks. And so why, why do I want to have a transition period where I have a mixture of the two inks, you see? And it's going to take like four refills before that mixture disappears to the point where it's just, you know, imperceptible. Don't. Just buy a set of pre-modified um, cartridges already perfectly flush. Fill them up with the ink. Reset the chips before that. And install them. And you're done. Then you can have fun, you know, performing the uh, flushing yourself. And then hating yourself for having chose to do that. Because it's a pain in the butt. You don't really want to deal with that. Uh, I'll be very brutally honest with you. You really don't want to deal with that. Just buy it already done. $60. What the hell? You know, we 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 waste more ink than that. Believe me. So that's it. Do not, do not basically add ink to your unflushed cartridges because you're mixing inks. You're mixing outputs. You don't know. You don't know until you start mixing them together what could possibly happen. So start from fresh. <laughs> I'm excited to have you here as well, my friend. Thank you. Got Togo now. Thanks for your support, Mali from the UK. Okay. So you're in the UK. Excellent. I spent um, three months there uh, working with the uh, British uh, military when I was in Special Forces. We had this fictional war with uh, fictional countries. It was all done electronically and, you know, like a big game. It was fun. All right. So, and of course, the other subject was about dealing, besides the yellow jello, dealing with flushing. And of course, it's, it's up to you. You don't absolutely have to. Now, use somebody else's yellow ink like this guy did. Yeah, you'll you'll have jello. You have jello. You'll you'll create that magic condition. Hopefully not, but you will have jello at some point. But the PC inks no longer jello. So whenever you see this result, it means your black channel is not printing. Simple. Anytime you see this, let me go ahead and post this photo. Don't pull out your hair trying to come up with a possible reason for this is your black channel. This is what you're supposed to get, but this is what you're getting, okay? Notice, so this is a piece of art, and I don't know whether it was scanned or not. That That is irrelevant, but it's supposed to print this way, but it prints this way. It's missing black, okay? The black is used to accent the darkest possible tone that you can create by compositing yellow magenta cyan. Okay, by doing so, you may only get like some of the deeper blacks. Notice the difference in detail. So here you have a lot of influence from cyan. Here I suspect this is an influence from yellow magenta cyan you get more of a neutral gray result so these areas they have less magenta and yellow and more cyan but it's supposed to look this way you see and look at i think that's a shadow um but yeah this is what happens when and how do you know how do you know how to you know you see this you see this coming out of your printer don't try to make adjustments. There's not it's not it's not necessary. Run a nozzle check. Run a nozzle check. Now we're gonna be printing something, some things. So what should I do? Run a nozzle check. So we'll just sit here and wait. Now 
I could do one of these. Like every night. Okay, this is from QImage. It's what they call the unclog tool. You schedule it to print every other night or every night or whatever. Do it when you're sleeping. You leave it on, you leave it minimized, and then you set it at a specific schedule, and it will print these types of uh, so-called perch sheets. That exercises your printer, but it's not a guarantee that it's going to be 100% unclogged. It is not. It's just printing something. Clogs occur for many reasons, and not necessarily going to, this is not going to ensure that we don't have a clog. The only way to know you have a clog or not is to run the nozzle check. And I don't have a clog. Now I know. You see that? Just because I did this last night does not guarantee that I don't have a clog. So I have to run one of these every once in a while. You have to. Don't wait until you get a weird result like that. And then go, oh, gosh, I better run an also check. Well, yeah, you better run an also check, of course. But And it will show one of these blacks not printing. In the case of this printer, it has two blacks. So it, it might show both of them not printing. I don't, I don't know what kind of paper that was. Maybe that was a matte paper, and it would have triggered a matte black ink if they're printing on a printer such as the 8550. Otherwise, if it's a dye ink printer, then definitely the dye black ink is not, it's not flowing because you saw what the top results look like, right? If it looks like this, that is not indicative of a clean or free-flowing black channel. This is. And on a regular photograph, it looks really, really odd. Okay, this is art. So it's going to appear different, but like a, a regular photograph, it will look almost like it's reversed, almost like it's a negative. So really, really strange results. So, of course, preaching always. <laughs> Run an also check. The second you see an, an issue that you're wondering what's causing this sudden change in my output, run an also check. It will show you. It's like, it's like going to the doctor. You feel dizzy, you feel your heart is pumping too fast, you get your blood pressure checked. And yeah, 150 over 80, like it was with me the other day. Yeah. So I told the doctor that I was just afraid to be there. I have high blood pressure. And so, yeah, that that is immediate an immediate um, diagnostic test. Do the nozzle check, and you will see exactly what's causing that weird output. Okay, it'll show you exactly. It will show you what section of that each channel is a vertical row of nozzles. It will show you exactly what section is not printing. <coughs> and then you run a cleaning cycle and then repeat that nozzle check, and hopefully that takes care of it. Normally, I'm down to like 130 over 70, something like that. But that particular day, I was just wound up i guess okay so <clears throat> let me see all right so molly said that she's from newcastle so that's in the uk obvious obviously all right so where's my media Okay, where are my new media configuration settings I installed on my Pro 1000? <coughs> you might say, what are you talking about? Configuration settings is what the creators of the drivers do. They create specific configurations or specific adjustments, settings, whatever you want to call it, for each type of media. Let me go ahead and open one of my drivers. And I'll show you what that is. And then we'll go ahead and print something. And I'll show you what I used to do with my wedding photograph. So let's just pick, let's just do the Pro 10. 
Not the Pro 10, sorry, not that. It's got to be the Pro 1000. So we'll do the Pro 1000. And we'll pop it over there to the other screen. So the question has to do with someone who then created media configurations for other papers. So let me just walk you through what happens with the normal media configuration. So you have, for example, Photo Paper Pro Platinum. So what is what are the specific physical characteristics of that particular paper? Okay. What what could be what makes that paper different than any other paper? So first of all, the paper coating. So it's a very, very glossy coating. That means that it may not require, in order to create a specific neutral, say gray, it requires a certain amount of dots from your yellow magenta cyan and black inks forget about all the colors that printer might contain let's just keep it simple so in order to produce a neutral rendition of that say a middle tone middle gray you require x amount of ink density okay more ink density and yeah the tone is still the same but it's just getting to look a little bit wet it's too much ink. And so what they do is they adjust. Now we're dealing with all the tonalities. Red, red, green, blue, cyan, yellow, magenta, and blacks. All the tonalities from black all the way to white. And they figure out what is the minimum amount of ink density required to be able to produce all of those values correctly so that they measure the correct value and then we'll start reducing the ink density. And then we notice that the values are changing. The, the readings are changing. But we reduced it too much. Let's go back to that nominal amount. Okay. If you go too much, then it begins to be excessively dense. In other words, it, it, it could physically look wet. It can cause problems with certain papers that will tend to absorb all of that all of that liquid and buckle. I've spoken about that in previous previous shows. So you know what I'm talking about. So you got to just exactly what's the minimum amount of ink I need density-wise. We're not talking about combination of dots, but the actual amount of ink density-wise I need to create all of those tones accurately. If I reduce it, then I it's no, no longer creating those tones accurately. It's actually coming out lighter and lighter and lighter. So you go darker, darker, darker. Oh, that's it. That's my maximum amount of ink that I need to create those perfect renditions of those tones. If I go beyond that, it begins to look wet. So that's my magical point. That's one of the settings. The other one would be, um, does it require matte black or does it require photo black? That means if it's a glossy surface paper, it requires photo black because it's glossy. If it was a matte paper, it would require the triggering of matte black ink because it's matte. And so the other one, the important ones here as well, are the thickness of the media and the stiffness of the paper base, in other words. So that creates a certain gap setting between the printed bottom of the plate, the nozzle plate, and the surface of the paper. What about texture? If it has a very rough texture, then you have to create sort of like a a, um, a guess of what would be the minimum uh, gap that I would require so that I don't really rub against those bumps of that heavy texture. So it has to kind of increase the gap to give you a certain amount of leeway so you're not ever going to be rubbing the bottom of your nozzle plate on those bumpy surface papers. Okay. It, it, yeah, it, it's it's that critical. So all of these all of these parameters are saved as a configuration file and is then installed in your driver. So that when you look up, in this case, it would be Photo Paper Pro Platinum. All of those settings automatically are applied when you choose to print on that paper. That's what happens when you pick a paper choice. 
Nothing to do with an ICC profile at this point, unless you set your color mode as ICM. So if we go here, and let me see, uh, da -da -da -da. right here, color management, manual adjustment, matching. And I set it to ICM, and I can go here and choose the standard profile. I can go here and auto. It will find that profile for me. See, there it is right there. And then perceptual or relative. So I will always choose relative colorimetric. If I click OK, I'm printing on that particular paper on the Pro 1000 with that ICC profile because I chose ICM. It's like using color management through your actual printing application, whether it's Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever you're using. Q image is different. Q image does that automatically for you. So that's what the media configuration uses. Okay. So be aware of that. So if you can create your own media configurations yourself with the so-called, I believe it's called the Canon, not the accounting manager, but it's media configuration tool. So you're just going to print all these samples and you're going to then generate all of these results. And then you pick the correct ones. Again, doing all of that process that I just described of printing at different density levels and you figure out what's the most optimal setting and then that is saved, and then you then transfer that over to the printer, and then you transfer that over to the driver in your computer. It's a hell of a process. So once you are done with it, they appear here. Normally, they will not appear anywhere else. So let's just say platinum, plain paper, photo paper, fine art papers, hagaki, Japanese papers, custom. This is where the media configurations will show up. And there they are. So you may end up, say, if you're good enough and you know how to create these using the media configuration tool, and you install them, you think you install them, and yet you cannot find them here. You install them on the driver, I mean, the printer, you install them on the driver, and they still don't show up. You got to do this. You got to go to maintenance. And then here it says, update media configuration. Okay. Updates the media information on the printer driver. So if you don't do that, they're still sort of in limbo. Once you update that, then they will appear in the custom tab. Okay. Right here. And there they are. So if I'm printing on Palo Duro etching, all I got to do is pick that. And it says paper source, top feed is not available for the selected media. I have to choose the manual feeder right there. You see that? I cannot feed through the through the paper top. That paper is supposed to be fed through the manual feeder in the rear. So all of those, all of those reasons, in other words, what's the reason for feeding it on the manual feeder? Because the paper is too thick and too stiff. It will possibly not make that curve correctly from the top feeder. So you have to put it through the rear feeder. It's more of a straighter path pathway. And that's why they tell you. And how do they know that? Because they tested it. And that's part of the media configuration. Okay. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So that is it. That is how you do that. I've done uh, installation videos using media configuration tools from Red River and walk through the whole process. Look that maintenance. Um, look for that. Um, that. Uh, section uh my god i forgot what it's called um playlist look for that playlist and walk through the videos that i posted there and it'll show you the process of how you go about installing it downloaded uh am1x file i believe they are designated as and you can get those from certain paper manufacturers especially red river they provide them for you for all of their papers and for the Pro 1000 and the 2000, all that whole family of printers that allow you to do that. Okay, so take advantage of that. It's free and it's super pain in the to make them yourself unless you're really patient and you're really, really good and you know what you're looking for. Okay, when I did weddings, this is what I used to do. Let me show you this. So let me open up this folder here. Then we'll go ahead and print something. 
Okay, we got an hour and 22 minutes into this, so we have plenty of time. All right, so I have saved here. Let me shrink this down a little bit. There we go. Uh, these are these are folks, okay? So this is um, my daughter, Judy. So these are some of the shots. That morning, uh, we went to the uh, hair salon, and uh, this is what they did for her. This is this is her her um, maid of honor. Beautiful girl. She's still that beautiful, and still looks like she has an age a day. Look at that. So I did a motion effect on the pens, the makeup pens. Um, yeah. There's some powder right there. Yeah. Notice there's some blur, blur effects and that sort of thing. So I, she, she wanted something like artistic. So again, this is the person uh, applying the makeup on her bridal uh, honor. And this is my daughter getting her eyeshadow put in right there. Notice it's got that, that glow and fussy look that was done. So that's two layers. One is blurred a little bit, and the, then the bottom layer is sharp, and then you blend them. You use a blending mode, and then you can use an eraser tool and remove the top layer that's a little bit fuzzy and glowing. It's got the glow effect. You remove that, you erase that, and make the eyes look sharp, where the rest of the photo is more of that glowy look to it. This is them outside. They had to go outside for a, a short period. All right, so that is one folder. Now the wedding. So we'll start from the beginning real quick. Oh, I'll, I'll breeze through these. So again, notice that glow. That's what I was, that's what she wanted. I don't necessarily go for that now. Notice this is the mother-in-law. So I remove that 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 blur around her eyes. Always the eyes. You need to unblur them. And it's got to glow. It's a weird glow where the where the highlights they glow out and blend into the shadows. The reverse of that would be where the shadows are glowing. You don't want that. You want the highlights to glow and create that halo. Halo. So, and we're talking, you know, back in I think it was two thousand eight when she got married. So. That's no longer the case. We don't really utilize that type of effect too much anymore. This is my wife right here on the right. This is this is her mother-in-law, and this is Judy about to cry. Looking out the window. Oh, wait a second. This is my son. This is a, two of the, uh, the boys. This is Brian's best friend right here. This is Brian, the groom. Okay, here are the girls fuzzing all over my wife, making sure that that uh, flower is put on there straight. This is little Anne. We call her little Anne. She's an Indian girl. This is little Anne again, making sure that everything is. And this is uh, that uh, the groom's best friend's daughter. She's now a young woman. There she is. Look at that. And again, we'll just breeze real quick through these. Did you see that? Oh, my God. My wife just cannot behave. And there's Mr. Joe. Proud Papa. So I did two jobs. I actually did uh, some photography. And, of course, I was also the mother, of the father of the bride, if you will, so. Here are the boys right there. That's my mom and me. This is the venue where we did the wedding. That's my mom again. This is all the crowd. Okay, so we'll just breeze through these. So these are some of the layouts that I did. So. I created these floating 
images over backgrounds. Those would then be printed. Oh, sorry. I don't know why that one is so, well, what the hell did I do? You cannot press on the button too much. Okay, so this should be actually that big, but that's, I think I just kept that too small. Anyway, this is the harpist we hired. This is one of the a acquaintance of my wife. She used to be a music teacher at her school. And uh, so you notice, you see the the overlays. These are these were then printed as such and then framed that way. And it gives you the impression of a, fo a floating print on a background when it really isn't. It's just an optical effect. Look at that. I love this one. I printed this on uh, sublimation aluminum. It turned out pretty good. It was a pretty close match, but not perfect. But it's still, it's just amazing the way it came out. These are the two little ring bearers, bearers. There's Brian. There's his friend looking out the window. This is at the party. Now, the minister married all of these couples here. So they were all there too. All right, so that is it for that. Let's go ahead and jump over to another. Let's see. This is one of my friends from school, not from school, from work. And uh, So I, I do these effects in Photoshop and then use them to then produce a print. So as you see, there's a drop shadow coming from the upper left on this floating image here onto this background. And then I print that with a black stroke around it to begin with. And that's it. It, it, it gives you a super, super high quality and very high end look. To your finished print. I do not do this any longer. Um, not for any particular reason. Just I just don't. Let's see. So then I made the the album pages. So this is what I used to do. So this represents one page. And then that page, that one, that one. As you can see, once these are printed by the album company, it just looks marvelous. They do it back to back. Um, I just did a bunch of different types of layouts. I used to work with this girl in the lab. Look at this, her mama, party girls. Yes, indeed. All right, so that's the type of pages that I would make. And I used to call it story, storybook weddings. That was my, my logo, my name. Uh, so everybody knew storybook weddings. Oh yeah, that's Jose's uh, company. And I did some special prints. Let me see if I can double click on that. There we go. And this is again, I she's not just sharp, but everything else becomes blurred as it reaches the edges. And it's all done by masking. And that was very popular back then. I 
Lucky for me, though, that these girls were not bridezillas, as some of them tend to be. And uh, everything was very calm and easy to deal with. Of course, my price was very good, so they knew they were getting a deal because they were all people that I knew and I was very close to. So I never really charged them, you know, what normally people charge for weddings this day and age. So. So these are the overlay type prints again, using the same images. Overlay type images, I should say, not prints. They will eventually become prints, yes. And so then this one here turned out just a beautiful girl. Look at that. Just gorgeous. So that is, that is enough for that. Let me go ahead and close. And uh, let me see what else I got here. Oh, I did a, uh, a wedding at Disney World. And we went into the chapel, the Cinderella Chapel. And uh, that was quite an experience for us. When you look through the window, there is a Cinderella Castle right there. You see it? Right there. At the Magic Kingdom. And look at the man with the uh, rings and the pillow. So this, this girl worked at Disney when my wife worked at Disney as well. And so this man is a Secret Service um, agent. And they met, fell in love, and got married in Disney World. He's passing out petals of, um, I think it was roses. And then we're supposed to throw them at the bride when they come out like that here they are at the reception dancing with mickey minnie and that's it all right so you can you can see that i just didn't do this okay when i was young and able to get, get around and do things more ed energetically that's not the case anymore so let's go ahead and get ready to print something because we got about half an hour left, and uh, I promised my wife that we would be done by two-ish today. So I'm going to go ahead and open Q image, and we're going to load a couple of images here. I got one, two, three, four images, and uh, yeah, that should be it. So Q image. Have any of you guys done weddings or events in the past? And this is like I was telling you, you see all of those photos and those sets of pages and all of that? Q image. And you save the job. And then you can recall it so that Aunt Millie across the country was a set of those pictures. And I say, which wedding was that? The Wilson wedding. Okay, I look up Wilson wedding. And there are all the photos that I did. All I have to do is click on that button and then choose job. I choose job. All the photos are immediately loaded as they were originally. And Q image, you can stack photos. You can't do that in, in Photoshop. You got to print one image at a time. You go to file, print something you have open and print it. I think in Lightroom, you can select a number of prints of images, but Q image is the, is the tool to use for this. It truly is. Let me go ahead and shrink it. I want to make it fit on my crappy little monitor over here. Here we go. All right, so we're going to choose uh, this location is my desktop. And we are going to load one of these images here. And this is the new one that uh, Harold just sent me. So we'll go ahead and test that as well. Now, 
Do I have it here? Yeah. Hang on one sec. Let me go back to me so I can show you what I'm going to then show you. So this is a photograph that I converted to a painting. I literally created a layer and I went to town with digital brushes. I did not just use a button to create a fake image. So we'll put that here. I'm going to show you the original photo from where, you know, from which I did that uh, so-called painting. This is right, right here. Right there. Boom. So this is what it looks like. Let me go ahead and open it. Pop it over there. That's what it looks like. That's all it is. And this is it right here. So, you know, you are getting just a very, what kind of style was that? Where it was, things were just simply suggested. They did not have uh, a lot of detail on them. So you really cannot see, um, I forget the type of uh, style. Um, a lot of the painters um, back in the day did that sort of uh, type of painting with wide brush strokes. Just sort of suggest a head, suggest a body, suggest an upper body, a lower body, a chair. And you can see the difference between that and this. You see what I mean? So we'll go ahead and print that just to see how it looks like. Well, now here's what we're going to do. So we want to make sure that we're using... Let me go ahead and close this command right there like that. I'm going to load, first of all, the settings that we need. So we're going to be using, again, this is for people who may have never printed on, on QImage. I'll just walk you through very, very uh, easy methodology that you can use to print. So... I see something here from Harold. Hang on one second. I've never done wedding photography, but I had a video production company, 70 and 80s, and shot my employees' weddings. Okay, so a lot of people, yeah, back then, they wanted video. And I also did that as well. Um, but most of the time, I did photography, just still photography. The uh, store, so-called storybook wedding, I used to take my video and actually float it do a lot of different effects and things like that as well to keep that storybook type of, of um, uh, look going. Yeah, it's just the, the output algorithm that it uses is just superior to anything I've seen. So, and also if you apply any kind of sharpening effect, it's magical. It's, it's something that's not going to have the same issues with a normal, say, uh, what they call unsharp mask that you can do in most editing applications. You might end up with, if you overdo it, you might end up with some halos and other kind of weird artifacts. So that's why I prefer to use Q image. All right, so let's go ahead and set this up so we're gonna be printing behind us 80 uh, ecotech 8550 so click on that and we're going to choose the 8550 if i can read it 8550 right there and we're going to print on the mat presentation mat and we're going to choose uh, letter size and you see that we get all these different layouts that it sort of defaults to. That's not what we want. We want to print, uh, say, with a half inch border. So the way to do that, now you have gotten to this point, that's fine. 
Uh, we're going to use my custom profile. Click on that tool there. We're going to either suggest or look for it. We're going to suggest. What it's going to do is going to suggest that paper profile for that choice, okay, that I that I just picked. Presentation paper mat. Why did I choose that? Because that's the paper choice that I used to create a custom profile. Why? We're printing on Canon paper. So I chose that particular Epson paper choice being the closest thing that you could find in the driver. I printed my chart of patches, I scanned it, and I created that profile. So now we got to load that profile. I got to find it first. So let's see. Oh, look at that. Epson EcoTank 8550 Canon Photo Paper Pro Premium Matte. Notice it's almost at the top. I named it correctly so that this would not have trouble finding it. Double click. We want relative colorimetric and we want black point compensation. Click OK. Now we just want to, well, I don't want to print, um, what is this, like three, four by sixes? No, I want to fill the whole sheet. So go to print, go to more, and then you're going to choose the second choice, specify one dimension or border size, and then we're going to click on the third option and type in 0.5, hit OK, boom. You see that? It's because I selected this already. I pre-selected it. It loads it. I'm going to remove it because we're going to print this one first. This was done at Gettysburg during one of the um, so-called, um, I think it was during the actual days of the Battle of Gettysburg reenactment. We're going to click on this because this is a raw file. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. We're going to do some slight adjustments to it, possibly. So I think it's going to be OK if I just click on the exposure. Auto exposure will set a black point just, a block, just above black, 0.5 above black, and a white point, 0.5 below white. We'll click on that. And this is the adjustment. Not much. It didn't have to do much. And I'm going to go ahead and click on 1x. And that will give me a life-size rendition of that image. I'm going to go ahead and sharpen. You see how this is not so sharp. So I'm just going to add that magical deep focus sharpening. That's really amazing because it does not create halos. Had this been a uh, regular um, unsharp mask, you can end up with some art artifacts if you overdo it. So we're just going to clear. All of this I'm doing is extra. I don't have to really do any of this but I'm just doing it to improve the image. I could have done this in my editing application. It doesn't really matter. So I'm going to do a radius of two, and then I'm going to increase, say, by 150 amount, and look at the difference already. You see that? Let me see if I can get a before. Hold, toggle, on. That's off, on, off, on, off, on. You see the difference? Amazing. And there are no artifacts. Look at the hairs. You can see the hairs on here, actually. So, you know, if I want a little bit more, I'm going to be printing on matte paper. So it always, it, it's always recommended that you increase sharpening, output sharpening a bit more for your matte uh, medias. So we'll do 200 just for fun. And still, it just improved it even more with absolutely zero artifacts. That's wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and increase the resolution. Increase, not the resolution, the saturation a little bit. So we're going to say maybe 15 in there. So, and I think the density is fine. Click OK. Beautiful. So this is ready to be printed. I'm going to crop that off. You see that there? That I don't want that there. That will draw my eye to it. So I'm just going to simply grab, click right about here, and come down 
to maybe here just a little bit about that's too much foreground i think so i'm just gonna click right there like that and then i'm gonna increase down to here almost to the edge and we'll see gotta increase this side i don't know why it's doing that Oh, I got the crop. Oh, that's why. I forgot about that. Undo that and undo that. It's actually picking up a format. You got to be careful when you do that. So I just want to remove this. So I'm just going to click here and maybe right about there. So I'm actually reducing the amount of foreground. Come on. I hardly ever do this, folks. So, okay, that should be it right there, like that. So, we'll go ahead and uh, say done, click OK, and now it will set that image. Remove this, I don't want that yet. Perfect. Now, am I cropping it? Yes, I am, because it wants to fill that space, including that half-inch border that I created. I'm going to select it, and I'm going to undo auto-cropping. This is what I want. Okay, so that's what we are going to print. And let's see what else. Let's do our friends. Now, he did the editing over here, so I'm not, I am not going to touch that at all. I'm going to go ahead and just sharpen it. Let me see what happens if I add a There we go. Okay. And again, I am not cropping it. I'm just filling it as much as I can, filling the space available as much as I can. This margin is half inch, this margin is half inch, and then the other two margins is whatever whatever the ratio of my images happens to be, okay? So that is it. We can now print these two images without any issues. They should match exactly or pretty much exactly what we have on our screen here. And all I have to do now is just click and print. Now, I did this by hand, step by step, but I didn't really have to, okay? Once, it, once the queue is up, I'll show you what, I have been able to do with Q image as long as I'm using that particular paper and of course the custom profile that I made and the letter size, media size. Um, as long as those three things are the same, I can just recall it. And I don't have to be che you know checking and picking and searching and doing all of that. So once this let this load and it'll begin to print. I'll go ahead and walk you through what I already have preset. So say this is the type of layout that I like. I can go to this button right here, click on it, give it a name, a distinctive name that identifies that setting to produce this type of layout. Half inch, half inch, and whatever. Okay. So let's go ahead and wait. It's almost done. So I would, I would go here. Let me move this out of the way here. I would go here and simply give it a name, a name that I can then identify as that particular paper, that particular printer, that particular layout, and then recall it. Once I save it as a setting, I can then recall it. Now, since I've already done that, let's go ahead and remove all of this and just simply go to the folder, click on my dates, and I'm gonna look for it. So Epson EcoTank 8550 Canon Photo Map. 
That's 13 by 19. So that would give me a 13 by 19 paper. Watch this. See that? Done. And I can just go ahead and print that. And it will be set to the correct profile, correct size, 13 by 19, and presentation paper mat. Let's change that. Let's go back and choose what you, we just printed on, the letter size. Printers and settings, folder, click on the date, and look for that one. So Canon Pro Mat, letter size, right here. Double click, boom. Now I can then set whatever I wish for my borders, myself. I already have half inch. We don't want that image. We want to print this one. And done. Print. Oh, wait a minute. Did I check to see if it was the right profile? Yes, it is. Right here is listed. You see? So whatever the whatever the settings requirements originally saved as will be recalled and all you got to do then is load the image and just print it don't worry about it it's going to be done correctly so the biggest worry of course is did i double profile because if i double profile my results are going to look odd they're going to really look weird it's done printing so let me go ahead and move this over here. So let's check on the printer setup. Click on that. And we're looking for none or no color adjustment, something similar like that. So we're going to normally it would be set here. We're going to go to custom, advanced, and let me see. Color controls. Hang on one second. There you go. AI driver fixed. So now we can go look and it should be none. None. No color adjustment. So that's that's the beauty. It will not let you double profile. So that, that's what we love about QImage. So you can set up as many configurations as you wish to have. Simply put, uh, if you do 300 of them. It doesn't really matter how many you do. It, it will be saved for you. So, you know, you get old like me and you begin to get forgetful and, you know, you just don't know what you did, especially with 16 different printers. Can you keep up with that? I can't. So I need something to help me. So, yeah, that's why I use QImage. And I don't use it specifically because... I'm using it for editing purposes. No, I use Lightroom for my editing, and then I export my edited image directly into QImage and print it from that application. Let's look at that monochrome first. Let me turn on. And next week, let's see. Yeah, next week I will do a demonstration using black and white mode. We're going to see what's possible, what's what can be done that's different than printing with an ICC profile, a monochrome print. So this paper has a slightly warm tonality to it. That is the default condition. So if you want something cold looking, very neutral cold, you're going to have to find a paper that has that type of character. So the paper base of this, this particular brand uh, is a little bit warmer than something like maybe platinum. Platinum is, is just perfect for something metallic and something that, you know, like an icy landscape um, with icebergs, that type of thing. That's what it would be good for. And let's look at the detail. I want to use my bad eyes. Marvelous, marvelous detail. Looking at the sky, there's a lot of very gradual tonalities there that if your printer would be leaning toward maybe not be able to create transitions, smooth transitions, you would begin to see a weird type of banding 
called post posterization is not a mechanical banding. It's like like when you see a, a paint by numbers and you have areas that are this shade and again another amorphous area next to it of a slightly different shade. That's that's what would happen, and it's not there. So the you know can the eighty five fifty print smooth transitions? Well, there you go. You see any kind of weird posterization? No. And by the way, it is neutral. I don't care what it looks like on the monitor here. This is really truly neutral. And I'm looking at it with my eyes, with my lighting here. And yeah, very, very nice. Let's look at those two little girls here dressed up in their 1860s outfits. Look at that. And what is she eating? She's eating something pastry or something. So again, I used to love going to these events. This is a true test for banding. And a lot of people can't do this for some reason or other. They're always complaining to me about it. You saw me. Did I do anything special? No. All I did was last night I did a, a perch image to supposedly exercise the printer like it needs it. I did it anyway. And then before we started, I ran the nozzle check and it was perfect, right? So that means that I should not get any kind of banding. Banding tends to happen on that type of sky. Look for any irregularities. Remember, a pass by the printhead is laying down just one set of rows of dots, dithered dots. And then it advances a little bit and it lays down overlapping another row of dots and beyond that unprinted edge a little bit, say an eighth of an inch worth of dots. So it's actually laying down maybe half inch worth of dots, but it's overlapping an eighth of an inch every single time, every single time or more. It depends. Do you see where each head pass is? Search, come on. Do you see anywhere that tells you that this was created with a roller going back and forth each time advancing maybe an eighth of the roller's width overlapping 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 this is the killer type image that would show on any printer that has issues that type of banding and it always seems to occur on skies i don't know why is that cyan i don't know don't ask me why, but I, I really do not do not know. But I don't see anything. You see that? And so my results, and again, am I going to go back to my monitor and oh, scrutinize this and say, oh, it's off by a... No, this looks great to me. Anyone I give this to, they're not going to say, oh, ho hold on, buddy. You need to take me to your monitor, and I want to see whether this matches my print that you gave me for free. No, no one's going to do that. So they're going to look at this and they're going to love it and they're going to accept it. Is that a perfect, absolute match? Of course not. It, it cannot possibly be. Is it a reasonably gorgeous, almost accurate result? Of course it is. That's all you have to worry about. The way this is viewed by reflective light is day and night different than what we're using a monitor for. That's transmitted light. So it's not ever going to match. Okay, this is super dull. This is super brilliant. So it's, it's just simply not going to match. Okay. Just today we saw a couple of bikers with the super neon tops on. And I told my wife, yeah, a monitor can can show that, but a printer can never print that. And it's true. It's just incapable of printing that type of glow. So when you look at your prints through the computer, 
be aware that they're not going you're looking they're not ever going to match and you're looking for color accuracy you're not looking for that the difference the brilliancy of a monitor display compared to the dullness of printing on paper but does this look dull to you uh where's the girl um no and this place gosh i would love to be there hmm? and i would like to print this in black and white mode and add a little bit of sepia to it oh my gosh because that will make it look like from the 1930s because look at this village it's just glorious you see anyway so that is the way that I, I look at printing, this is how I approach my printing. Um, the result is something that should please me and not be a scientific match of the, you know, what you see on your monitor. You try to match the two as closely as you can because otherwise editing would make no sense then because if you're making a slight adjustment, you want that adjustment to be reflected in print form but just the, the the look of a transmitted image through the rear is just they're always going to be different okay always going to be different on something like this this is an uncoated paper um the blacks don't look as good as the ones on the coated canon paper printed on this 8550 they just simply do not okay if i printed this on canvas on roll canvas and notice that i signed it um this would look almost like a real um painted image you know unless you get up close and you realize it is not really uh, oil painting or something but yeah this looks duller than it would on a canvas that has been then uh, overcoated with a glossy uh, varnish that's what you do with canvas so is that awful no it's not that's the look of that paper okay and so you just accept it as the norm i think we made it 204 i think we went over a tiny little bit but hey i hope you guys did enjoy our saturday live stream as opposed to our normal sunday um now i gotta go up and come up with something for supper Let's see. No, not yet. Not yet. My wife is making a couple of dishes to take to the dinner tomorrow. Actually, it's going to be like an afternoon um, after uh, lunch. What do you call that? Not a brunch. That's breakfast and lunch. You know what I mean. Okay, let's see. Emmanuel says, hello, hello from Normandy. I forget the schedule, EcoTank 8550, awesome printer. Yeah, it is, it is. And uh, when you, if you can grab it, you know, on sale, just grab it. It's really, at all, I almost think that Epson made a mistake because had that not been such a great performer, then I would have just said, oh, well, of course, of course I need a p800 or a p900 yeah so that i can get super high quality results but good lord it's, it's super high quality results okay so you know do i want to then buy a high-end 13 inch wide printer maybe not a p700 no why oh because it's pigment big deal i had a photo in the back rear window of my car for three months and it has shown zero fading and it's on on crappy luster paper you know resin coated not the best okay if any fading is going to occur it's going to occur faster on those types of papers than on their finer line of papers that really adds a lot to longevity so anyway hope you guys enjoyed this um let's see he says thanks jose and then Henry Stoffel, oh, you just came on? I hope you uh, were here a little bit early so you can see what we were doing. He's from Metro Mass, uh, Epson PA100. 
OEM inks and QMH Ultimate. Awesome. Now, I like I said, I was promised mid uh, April the QMH people are going to be here, and uh, we'll we'll uh, gleefully uh, welcome them here with us, and then uh, we're going to bombard them with all kinds of all sorts of questions, and see if it took. Um, the hint on what I was talking about. Um, one of the things, speaking of what you see is may not be what you get. Um, if I had an image that, just like the standard image, it has purposely a set of color patches that are out of gamut. And you may be able to detect them on your monitor, but that's not necessarily mean they match the actual values of the image. Once you see them on your monitor, it's too late. Is that really showing me those values correctly? No, of course not. They're just way beyond the capability and definitely way beyond the capability of a printer. So if you have images like that and you want to bring them down to a printable condition, but you don't want to deal with rendering intents that can basically just grab everything shove it inside the gamut bubble disregarding what it does to any existing in gamut tones that may already be in there it just shows them people get in fill the room keep moving keep moving keep moving no no i don't want to move i'm i am in the correct position don't move me okay that's what that's what uh perceptual does relative color metric does not do that it it prevents shifting of colors that are in gamut already simply to allow other colors to get in they are squeezed in they're not going to be reproduced like you see them they're just being squeezed in okay so if i have an image that requires and i don't want a soft proof through an icc profile i just want it to be by a click of a button to be corrected so that then my printer can then print those colors. I don't want them to be outside the printer's capability. And then the printer has to struggle and guess, what should I do with these autogamma colors? Now, I want my application to anything that's iffy, questionable, to be brought in automatically. That's what I want QMH to come up with a one button solution, okay? And make it visible. So if I am looking at my image, it applies that. It knows I'm going to print it in this printer with this paper. So therefore, oh, that's going to require a ton of programming and a ton of information because it has to know the printer's capability, the paper's capability, the ICC profile's capability, and then it adjusts your image so that it meets all the capabilities of those three things. That would be fantastic. There will be no more of this. Oh, this red is not really what I see on my screen. Everything else looks the same, but my red could be improved a little bit. Oh, do I need to manually? No, you don't. Okay, you will not have to do that. It will then adjust the red in your image itself so that it is now printable instead of unprintable. Am I... Am I wishing too much we'll see he didn't call me crazy he didn't say i was nuts so it, it must be it must be something that is is possible to achieve all right that's it enough of that so let's go ahead and pick a slideshow we'll do the third one and uh we'll see you next week and i have more videos that i will be uploading uh, tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Tomorrow we're going to the party. And then Monday, Tuesday, we're off to Gettysburg. So we'll be there overnight with my son and my grandson. We're going to have a great time, yeah, especially since he uh, is in a bum mood right now. His um, Ever since he was a baby, uh, we had our neighbor and that kid, a bit older than Nathan was, uh, became his very first friend. And that very first friend now is like 20 years old. And he got stabbed last night over a breakup with a girlfriend. I don't know. So there's been an arrest made and all of that. But definitely poor Nathan is just 
suffering mentally right now because his best, his very first friend, he still visits him. You see, that is that kind of friend, that kind of friendship. And I got photos of them hugging each other as, as they were when they were young and everything. So anyway, so we will see you probably next Sunday as at a normal time. And uh, hope you guys have a wonderful week. Happy Easter tomorrow. Don't eat too much. I certainly will try not to baloney. Yes, I will. All right, we will see you then the next time. Happy printing, everyone. Bye-bye.